you turn with me to Mark chapter 14. And our text today, amazingly, is the whole chapter. And I, I, I got three amens on that. That's okay. That's all right. I'll explain myself here in a moment. <laughs> Somebody say, Lord, now don't worry. We're, you don't have to stand the whole time. Is that the issue? Is that what it was? You don't have to stand. We'll, I'll tell you what, we'll just read like the first two verses and then you can sit. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Our time together today is called Arrest and Betrayal and the Public Reading of Scripture. I threw that last part in to help, help explain what I'm doing today. Arrest and Betrayal, the Public Reading of Scripture. Father, thank you this morning for the reading of your word. And thank you, Father, that all by itself, your word has power. Lord, if we can just get our own sin and flesh out of the way long enough, you can speak to us yet today by your word and do speak to us today by your word. Now, Father, we humble ourselves under your hand, recognizing, Lord, that we are incapable of understanding this unless you ordain it to be so. And we pray that all application, everything that we glean from this today ultimately results not just in our good, but, Father, in your glory. I would rather glorify you than receive a blessing. And when the saints of God get to thinking like that, then revival just might be afoot. We love you so much, and we give you glory and honor and praise, for it belongs to you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, please be seated and keep your finger there and mark, but I want to I wanna read a scripture to you to explain kind of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. This is in your bulletin this morning. As you can see, the bulletin is, is shorter than usual. I need to get back to that a little bit. I've, I got to doing dissertations on Sunday, and I'm, I'm trying to, to deal with that. But Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, says this. And the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. Just tell your neighbor, you ain't gonna be here that long. Did y'all read that? And he read from the book of the law from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The apostle Paul told his young protege, Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, and King James said that word teaching there is doctrine. Now, as most of you know, most of the time when we come into worship, uh, we come into our times of teaching, there is, a, there is a lot of teaching. Uh, we, we spend a lot, I mean, there's notes and blanks, and, and, uh, and we think that's a good thing. We, we are called to teach the Word of God, and uh, this particular church has its own, you know, kind of set of distinctives that we operate by, for hopefully for the glory of God. Sometimes breaking down the, the word line by line, sometimes even word by word, sometimes we don't get further than a couple of verses. Uh, but there are those times when the focus isn't necessarily on applying the narrative, but simply reading. Somebody say simply reading. Simply reading the narrative and worshiping God through, through our listening, through our ability to be attentive as the word of God is read, as we saw there in Nehemiah chapter 8. The goal when we do this is to ensure that we lift up not what the preacher is saying, but what God says. And how many know we need, we need less of what the preacher says and more of what God says? Okay, I mean, and that's coming from a preacher, okay? <laughs> Most good churches do a lot of exhortation and teaching, and that's good, and that's right, and we do as well. But there's, all, there's often not a lot of reading of the Bible in church. It's almost as if, you know, people say, well, I could have read it at home. You know, give me something I couldn't get at home, you know. 
And, uh, and, but nevertheless, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy that he should devote himself to the public reading of Scripture. And so we do a lot of exhortation and teaching. Uh, we don't typically do a lot of reading. And so every eight to six months has been my goal. I haven't done very well at that goal, but every eight to six months or so, our goal is to have a Sunday or two where we throttle back on blanks and bullet points and just read the Bible. And, and it's done on purpose. I mean, I know it's not, you know, the amen, you're not going to, ain't going to have a whole lot of folk waving handkerchiefs and shaking when you do that, but, but that's not the goal anyway. The goal when we come into worship is not your blessing, actually. The goal when we come into worship is, well, worship. Okay? And so every six months, eight months, we want to do this, and I don't I kind of preface this because some of you may be here for the first time, you haven't seen us, just get up and read the Bible and just very few points and a lot of reading. But I want to preface this with how powerful this actually is, which is why I read Nehemiah there. And I want to kind of remind you of this wonderful story in 2 Kings is another wonderful example. Maybe some of you remember it. I will read this very quickly here from 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 8 through 11. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan, everybody's looking at Minister Rogers' wife, that's hilarious. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And that's all he did was read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Oh man, if you can just remember this, you can remember this story if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Over in 2 Kings chapter 23, you saw what this wonderful King Josiah did just by the book of the law being discovered, just by the book of the law being found and brought before the king, the king just by reading, just by hearing the book of the law, just by hearing how far the nation had gotten off from what God had commanded, mourned so badly that he actually got some of his boys together and he sent them to this woman named Holda, who was a prophetess, to give them some counsel on what to do. And, uh, and as a result of her words, that there would be great judgment coming upon the nation because they had, in fact, left the book of the law. Uh, Josiah got up literally and began to change the whole nation. He, I mean, he just started tearing stuff down and move, removing idols and getting rid of bad priests. And I mean, it was just wonderful. But my point is, all, the only thing that happened to, to precipitate all of this massive revival, massive reform and massive change is that the book of the law was read. I have believed, and this is getting stronger in me, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I have believed for a while now that most of us don't need counseling, we need to read God's Word. Talk to me, somebody. I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've begun to really see that a lot of times, not that counseling isn't good, but if you're not going to obey what God said, then what good is the counseling? I'm wasting my time. And I have, I have been in counseling sessions where I've literally thought to myself, didn't tell the person this, but I thought to myself, this is a massive, giant waste of time. Because I have just told you the, the same thing five different ways, and you're still giving me excuses as to why you aren't going to obey the word of the Lord. And so how many of you know that if you can't listen to the counselor who actually has given you the counsel, then sitting with me probably, I'm just a fl fleshly old man, sitting with me is not going to fix it. And I have come to believe that what America needs right now, somebody really needs to kind of walk up to the whole nation and go, thus says the Lord God of Israel. Because all we'd have to do is read it. And, and oh, for men and women of, with the heart like Josiah, who could hear the word of the Lord being spoken, be so torn up and, and, and tattered in their spirit because we have gotten off the word of the Lord and then cry out to God in repentance and then begin to get up. Literally, y'all, you all can get up tomorrow and begin to reform anything in your life according to the word of God if you would simply hear it. And the pastor don't have to be, no, the bishop ain't got to be nowhere around. You could go home right now. Are you married folk? Married folks, say amen. amen. You can go home right now and, and read Ephesians 5 out loud. Thus says the Lord God, 
and then begin, and then, you know, well, you don't have to tear your clothes like Josiah did. But then again, I guess you are married, so I guess that's okay. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but then again, I'm sorry, I got off there. But, and then you can literally begin to transform your house right from the Word of God. One can look at the other and say, I haven't loved you as Christ loves the church. One can look at the other and say, you know, I haven't really been submitting to you. You know what? We don't need counsel. Let's just go ahead and be obedient. Let's just try to be obedient tomorrow and then obedient the next day and you obedient the next day and you obedient the next day and you obedient the next day before you know it, you got a good marriage. So, we want to read today. I want to read to you today. And, uh, and we just want to hear this narrative as we move now into this resurrection season. Uh, yeah, yes, gosh, how do I say this? A lot of times our focus around Easter or resurrection is a little suspect. Um, I mean, because it, it's not that it's bad. Okay, well, we know the Easter bunny ain't got nothing to do with it. So when people email me, y'all ain't got no Easter egg roll for the kids, I'm not phased by that at all. I mean, it just, well, thank you. Okay. We didn't, we, I don't have eggs hidden around the sanctuary with little scriptures in them. I'm, forgive me for being a heretic. Uh, <laughs> but, but even beyond the Easter bunny in, in, in Cadbury chocolate eggs, because we know that's foolishness, but even beyond that, I think sometimes we in church don't take the, the time to really embrace what this season means. And, and I'm going to say this next one real gently because I'm guilty, but you know, ultimately, the resurrection season isn't even really about people. I, I mean, uh, we want people to be saved. Wave at me if you want people to be saved, okay? But let's not turn the season into a marketing ploy and miss the fact that this is when we celebrate the resurrection of the king. And so all the, all the marketing that has nothing to do with the resurrection that hits the church world around this time and people, all this, you know, cool and hip little stuff about how to draw people into your church, and, and it kind of misses the point. Jesus said, and when I'm lifted up, I'll draw. So let's, how about this? What if we lift him up? And then allow him to draw whom he will. So the reason why I'm thinking reading these narratives and having these narratives spoken before the church and pausing every so often to just kind of consider what we read, I think this is a good thing because maybe this could be a different resurrection season that we've had in the past. Maybe this could be one where the focus really is on Christ and by his grace, because the Christ becomes the focus in such a powerful way, then maybe by his grace and by his own sovereignty, he chooses to save and that would be wonderful. But I, I refuse, I mean, I'm just not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn the church into a mall on Easter. Amen. Mark chapter 14. And literally, I'm reading the whole chapter, pausing every once in a while, and then that'll be the sermon. <laughs> I'll start from verse one again because it's been a few minutes. And here we go. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people, or from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at, ta at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? 
She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. But whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Mm. One who is eating with me. Pause. You know, that's rough when your betrayer is eating your sandwich. I mean, wow. 19, and they began to be sorrowful and to say to him after one another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Goodness. Wave at me if you've betrayed him a time or two, though, and you're glad for grace this morning. Okay. Thank you, Master. And as they were eating, he took bread, and, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the new, or of the covenant, we know it's the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Mm. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night, old Petey, old boy, Sorry, that was pastor's ad lib. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Anybody in this room ever said, Lord, I'm with you. I ain't going to never turn my back on you again if you just get me out of this one. Ain't no way. And then you did it, and you're glad that he forgave you anyhow. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even 
to death. Remain here and watch. That's a very powerful verse, by the way. You're looking at this anguish that our Christ went through. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. I mean, can you catch that imagery? That's a deep, deep, deep sorrow. Remain here and watch. Verse 35, and going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. And I love this. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. Tell your neighbor, stay awake. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Hmm. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst of and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, <laughs> help me with this one, y'all. I am. Help me with this one. I am, and you will see the Son of Man 
seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And that was enough because that statement there basically let the high priest know that uh, Jesus claimed to be God because only God could say what he just said. And of course, he, he viewed that as blasphemy, and that's why we get verse 63. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him. It's church folks spitting on him. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. So they beat him up. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it. I wonder what folk would say or ask you, are you one of them Christian folks? You one of them ones that's messing up society right now? We can't get no love because the folk like y'all? Hmm. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. I don't know what y'all talking about. And he went out to the gateway and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. You know, most of us aren't bold to actually say that, but how many know you can do that by your actions or what you don't say? And immediately the rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Arrest and betrayal on the public reading of scripture. We just read the whole chapter. I have a few questions, points for you to consider. No blanks, no fill in, nothing dogmatic today, just allowing the word of God hopefully to speak to us about where we are, the season that we're in as a church and as a nation and as, the, and as, and as members of this thing we called the world, okay, uh, in it but not of it. And so if you look at your notes, just real, real fast, number one, how many of you know that people still plot against our Lord? So... People still plot against our Christ. We see it all the time, whether they are doing it intentionally or unintentionally. The question that I have, at least for myself, is what am I going to do uh, when the enemies of our Lord viciously attack him? What am I going to do? Uh, how am I going to approach this rapidly kind of depraved society that's descending quicker and quicker into those things that the Lord despises, and while at the same time trying to figure out how to undermine the words of the Lord in every area of life. So I put the question to you. People still plot against him, still look for ways to crucify him again, if you will, if you catch the imagery, still look at looking for ways to undermine his word, his will, and his way. What are you going to do? Number two, we read the, the quick narrative of the alabaster box. Now, obviously, you can do a lot of teaching on the alabaster box, and although most of the teaching on the alabaster box gets a little, well, anyway. Um, but you can, do, you can say a lot of things there. However, I'll simply say this. What costly thing are you willing to give Christ even when people disagree? The motive there was just pure love and worship. And even if that even if it means that you have to lose something, even if it means that you have to sacrifice something, even when people around you say, now that's just silly. It don't take what? It don't take all that. You ain't got to do all that. I mean, you know, and by the way, this church gets it don't take all that a lot. That seems to be one of our primary criticisms. It doesn't take all that. I mean, I know you love children, but it don't take all that. 
Uh, I know you love to preach the word, but it don't take all that. Uh, I know you, 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 you want to worship, but you know it don't take all that. You don't, have to, you, know, you don't have to say those things or do those things. And so that's a criticism that we get a lot, don't take all that. But how many know sometimes it does take all that? And so I believe our children's lives and souls are worth as much as we can give them, as an example, according to the word of God. So the question then is, what's precious to you that you basically need to break open and pour on the, Lord, the Lord's head and just totally sacrifice it for his glory alone? What, what, do, you need to, what do you need to let go? Because the, the narrative is pretty obvious. This woman just loved him and wanted to honor her Lord. I mean, we don't need to take it any further than that. What are you willing to do because you love him so desperately and you want to honor him? Is this okay? Is it all right that I'm not humming and jumping and everybody okay? Okay. I, I put it on Twitter this, a couple yesterday. I, I told all the young preachers I said, who might be listening or, or reading, I said, you know what? You know, you can just present the word. As far as I know, Jesus never hooped a day in his life. So it's okay. So, you know, all right. So what costly thing are you willing to give Christ even when people disagree? Number three, the spirit of Judas is alive and well. Money to betray the master. Okay, money to betray the master. You cannot serve two masters. You're going to love the one and what? And then you'll, you'll be faithful to the one and then you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so we always tell people, as much as I want you to have some money and save it, invest it, and be a good steward and so forth, but you never make decisions purely, purely based on money. First thing you want to do is figure out how it honors the Lord, okay? And so, you know, you should try not to do that. I think we've all done it a time or two, but you try not to do that. And so the spirit of Judas is alive and well, money to betray the master, okay? And I don't even have a point there. I just threw that out for you to consider in your own life how easy it is to fall into this, this success thing or achievement thing at the expense of the principles of God. Amen. I mean, it's just so ridiculously easy to choose the ladder of success. That's kind of a cliche. The ladder of success or an upward trajectory or more, more money in the bank at the expense of something that, that identifies who Christ is or something that Christ said or something that Christ wants from us. And oh, by the way, as we've said many, many times, integrity to the word of God and to your master will cost you money. You can't give me a disciple that didn't lose a lot messing around following Christ. But the, it's the same is still true today. And so let's not, let's be careful with that Judas thing that's still hanging around that, that, that kind of goes along to get along, even at the expense of Christ. Number four. Jesus willingly chose Judas and was willingly betrayed. He was sitting with his betrayer. He knew it, yet he did it for our sake. That might be a, a, a place right there for us to just pause and worship for a moment. Because what a Savior. What a Savior came to this earth knowing that he'd be brutally treated by his own creations and betrayed by one that he himself, he himself chose. He knew he chose the devil, and he did it on purpose. So I wonder if you'll just take a moment and thank God, because we were all there too. All betrayed him, yet all still chosen. Well, we worship you, Lord. You're good. We bless your name. Number five. Friends deeply, y'all okay? Friends deeply consider the propitiation of Christ. We don't put nearly a, 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 as much emphasis here, and this is what I want to do at Easter. I want to do in resurrection. I want to talk about the blood. I want to talk about the propitiation. I want to talk about what he actually did. I want to explain the sacrifice of Christ because we don't put a lot of emphasis here, or if we emphasize it at all, it's for our own personal circumstances. You know, the cross means I'm going to get this, and the cross means I get that, and the cross means I'm going to walk in victory, and the cross means I'm going to be victorious. But you know, the cross is all about him being victorious. And we're only victorious as he was victorious. What was he victorious over? He was victorious over the powers of hell, over death. So we are victorious over the powers of hell and death by his blood, by his propitiation, not anything that we've ever done. And so it, I said this over in Roanoke. I said, let's not pervert the gospel of Christ. 
Let's not turn the precious blood of the lamb that redeemed us from sin into something that we sprinkle over a car so that we can have a new vehicle. That is a pervert, that, I mean, it, it, we don't think of it like that because we've all been inundated by the prosperity gospel to the point that we can't even realize it, but the blood of Christ had a very unique and, and precious purpose and the only blood in the universe that could actually do it. The propitiation of Christ simply is this. It is Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Son, taking the holy blood after having kept the law perfectly to the, to the heavenly mercy seat, sprinkling it on our behalf and making final atonement for the sins of man. You know, it is, it, is, it is that precious. He died, suffered, bled, and rose again for the remission of sin. And when the church turns that, and yeah, yeah, we got that sin thing, but no one wants to talk about sin. So let's just, this is when Christ really died for your purpose. He really died for your destiny. He really died so you can flow and all that he has for you. You know, y'all, can I, I mean, it sounds good. Sounds really good to a lot of people. But the truth of the matter is, what did he have for the disciples? They flowed in it. He had death and torture for the disciples. What did he have for the early church? They flowed in it. Death and torture some more. But somehow we think that flowing in, in the sacrifice of Christ means, you know, four bedrooms and two and a half baths. What, what an absolute perversion of the precious blood of the Lamb and we now have to come back to telling people that he died because we're lawbreakers. He suffered because we broke the commandments of God. He, he, he was literally, as we read, he was slapped and spat upon and beaten by his own creations and by the religious folk because we are unable to get to him. Therefore, he had to come to us. The, it's the blood of Christ that, that enables sinners like us to lift our hands in service. It's the blood. It is the blood of Christ that wipes away the offenses against you. It's the blood of Christ that takes our ledger of daily law breaking and absolves it before a holy God on the day of judgment. I wish I had somebody. I, I, I'm trying to just, just, just get this in here. And so when we preach the gospel, that's where we must go. We cannot go to come to Jesus and you'll have a good life. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a good life coming to Christ. In fact, many times coming to Christ will mean more turmoil, more drama because of family members and friends who will not accept this new love for holiness that you all of a sudden have. And so when he institutes the Lord's Supper and he says this blood is the blood of the covenant, okay, he's, he's beginning to help us remember and understand the, his propitiation, his substitutionary atonement for our sin. Anybody glad that your sins have been washed away this morning? I mean, you know what? And, 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 and Christians, Christians who are in the room, okay, when you come to worship, can I, I'm going to give you a worship tip that has helped me out a lot. Okay, leave your circumstances at the door. The Mexican signs right there just take off the alternator and the burnt chicken, and the job, and the bill collector ringing your phone, scaring your wife when you ain't home. Everybody born in the 60s and 70s got that joke, okay. Leave that at the door. When you walk into a corporate worship environment, let it be about the blood. It's holy hands that you lift, and you are, if you're a Christian, your circumstances doesn't change your eternity. At all. I mean, at all. But we built, a whole church culture is built on helping folk with circumstances. Now, is there anything wrong with helping people with circumstances? Of course not. But is that the primary thing? No. And so we pastors, and Pastor Connie, you listen, we pastors pull all our hair out helping people with problems when actually we need to equip them to be above their problems. Because in this world, you'll have tribulation anyhow. And so we need to equip them to have joy in the midst is the word there. 
Okay, I'll prove it to you. Please, wave, please lift your hand up and let everybody see it if your life right now is absolutely perfect. Wait a minute, some of y'all been saved a long time. Some of y'all got anointing oil on your forehead right now. Y- your life ain't perfect, really? Okay, lift your hands if you've ever had like a perfect month where you've had no problems whatsoever in life ever. Going once. <laughs> Going twice. So then if you build your faith based upon that which is inherently because we live in a fallen world, flaky and shaky, as opposed to on the propitiation of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then you will be able to come into worship because it was never about the job. It was never about the visa card. Are we minimizing those things, saying they're not important? They are very important. They're just not as important. So, again, explaining over and over again the propitiation of Christ. It's a wonderful time to do it. And when we, and as you can see, when we do the Lord's table on first Sunday, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to explain again the propitiation of, of Christ. It's so important. We need to take the time to think about the grace of God in Christ Jesus to allow his son literally to be beaten and spat upon, to go on to be crucified. You know, the word, the, where we get the word excruciating, the word excruciating literally means from the cross. I mean, it literally had to make up a word to try to explain what he went through on the cross. I mean, so, so that's, imp- that's critical. Number six, the disciples did in fact fall away for a time, yet each except Judas was restored and forgiven by Christ. Anybody ever been there where you fell away? Any, anybody willing to admit falling away? Are you glad that the Lord forgives you? Anybody really happy that, you know, he didn't say, that's it, you out. Anybody glad that when you honestly repented, he restored you? (laughs) I just, okay, is there anyone in the room who knew the scriptures and knew what you was about to do was wrong? Has, okay, have you ever done this? Now, I'm getting real deep now. I know all of you ain't gonna, you're not gonna say amen here. But could any of y'all ever quote a scripture right before? The, the Bible says, let nothing but, you know, let nothing but words that uplift come, of your, come out of your mouth. But you know what? I don't care. And bleepity bleep bleep. Okay, you, wow, you quoted like Ephesians 4 and then just wave at me, you know, our God is merciful. I just, because you look at these disciples, they weren't, they were imperfect men. The Lord had told them they would fall away. The Lord said, the, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. And Peter, you know, with the mouth, you know, Peter. Peter's all, no, no, I got this. And there he is, not only denying Christ, but cursing to make sure the point was emphasized. Well, we've all done it a time or two, and thank God for his mercy. Number seven, consider the anguish of Christ as he faced the burden of carrying our sin. Yet it was the Father's will he wanted Oh, Lord, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I want or will, but as you will. Of course, again, that's a lot to to think about. But one of the narratives over in Luke tells us that as he was praying, it it, it was as if the sweat from his body had exuded blood literally sweating blood. There's actually a medical condition, hermatidosis or something like that, where literally the sweat glands are surrounded by blood vessels and great, great stress gets it to the point where your skin literally bleeds. Uh, So there, I mean, it's definitely supernaturally possible as well as physically possible. But the anguish was so great one way or the other 
that the, that the Lord cried out, knowing what he would have to go and do for our sake. And yet the disciples slept. They were so tired, they couldn't stay awake. And he came back to them not once, not twice, but three times. Oh, a lot we can say here. Because the Lord did, in fact, this is historical as well as, as, uh, as, well as you know, just a narrative. But this, is, this happened. He, was, he literally was in the Garden of Gethsemane and literally did go through all of this and literally did go to the cross for our sake. And I've said this recently, but I just, I, I'm going to say it again. Church, we need to wake up. We need to wake up to what he did. And we need to stop positioning it for our benefit and, and for our life, our living, the short little time on the earth. And we need to declare the gospel to the world again, the true and the whole gospel of, of Christ. We need to wake up. It, we're, like, we're like the people who, are so, who literally are so tired and, and so, so filled with blessing that we're asleep at the switch. But God's calling us to something different. He's calling us to go back and to, to let people know because we love him and love them about the full gospel of Christ. So much more we can say. Number eight, betrayed with a kiss. And yes, Lord, let the scriptures be fulfilled. I don't have much to say there. We read it. You saw what happened. You saw Judas came over and kissed him and he said, take him away. Betrayed with a, with a kiss. Number nine, Jesus, the king of kings, arrested and taken before his own creations. The religious who should have known who he was, spit upon Mocked, beaten, again, by the religious. You know, I'm at a place in my journey with him that as much as I would like to say, well, if, it were, if I was there, I would have knew who he was and I would have done those things to him. You know, I, I, I can't say that. You know, something about walking with the Lord doesn't make you more arrogant. It, it, it makes you more aware of your sin. Has anyone seen that where you, 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 you know, you kind of walk a little bit with him and then you, you walk a little more and you go, wow, I'm really messed up. Anybody ever have that moment where you just kind of, you know, you get to a certain place and somebody, you know, something happens or your church is doing good or you have your, your fellowship is doing good or whatever and you walk with him some more and you just kind of go, wow, you know, the more I read, the more I realize just how much, I mean, I could have been this guy. I could have been this guy. I could have been one of those Sanhedrin in that room with my little robes on so filled with my own whatever that who, how dare this man? You know, it could have been me. Could have been me. I could have, I could have been this guy. And, uh, and only by his grace, are, you know, are we to have enough sense to know who Jesus is. But I, it could have been me. And so I, looked at, I look at them and obviously they deserve some flack for what they did to Christ. But, you know, we all kind of put him on that cross, didn't we? And we've all kind of spit upon him, haven't we? And we've all kind of beaten him. And we've all kind of mocked him. And, and there, there's been moments where we could have stood up for his name in some environment and we did not. And there's this moment, there, there have been moments where even though he's king, we act like there's some area of life that he's not king over. And there have been moments where we've chosen our own whatever and not Christ. And can I just get somebody to talk to me here? Just for, I mean, we read the narrative. Can I mean, we, there have been moments in my life, uh, and certainly I'm sure in yours as well, where I knew better, or I should have spoken up, or I chose the easy path because I knew saying those words would just put me at odds with everybody. And so, is that, does that amount to a denial? Well, in my book it does, in your book it might not, but in my book I've denied him in that instance where he had me positioned to speak up for his name and to bring to whatever that thing was, the glory of Christ, and I chose through expediency or fear or my own so-called knowledge not to. So I've been, I've been this Sadducee a time or two myself. And oh Lord, please forgive me. Look at this. Isaiah, this is just the fulfillment of scripture, Isaiah 50 and 6. I gave my back to those who strike in my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Isaiah 53, you know this one very well. Most of you have read it a time or two. But who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground and he had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes we're healed. We're all like sheep. All like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on, oh my Lord. The Lord has laid on him. The iniquity of us all. So how do you not worship that one? How, how do you not lift a hand? Preach a word? change a home, disciple your children? How do you, how do we go on day after day with so much carnality and allow it? He laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. <laughs> people say that it's never the will of the Lord to crush. Okay. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand out of the anguish of his soul. And he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Isn't that interesting? Crucified with one sinner on one side and one on the other. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This day you will be with me in paradise. Lastly, betrayed by Peter three times, I believe Peter, heartbroken over his own cowardice, wept. Um, I can't prove that. It just seems logical. But heartbroken from his own cowardice, Peter wept. And as we close up today, again, just having read with some basic, basic thoughts on what we read. Oh, Lord, forgive us all for betraying you. Forgive us for times when we should have spoken should have given our lives, should have obeyed, should have made a difference, should have sacrificed our alabaster boxes for thy glory, and did not. Thank you for being a merciful God to us. We love you and we worship you.